Hi, my name is Elisa, and you're with me and Jeremy here on the 78th speed run of Downtime Podcast. How are you doing, Jeremy? I'm doing very well. I didn't know that we were doing SGDQ today. I, You know what? I didn't know either until I decided to say that on this recording. <laughs> but I but will say all... that I am genuinely tired. Yeah, I'm very tired as well. I had a very long week. I had a very long week too, but you are drinking whiskey now, so... I know. It's making the pain go away. And the pain is actually coming from the northern fires in yes. Northern California that are affecting the Bay Area. Yes. For our listeners who aren't from California, there's oh, actually, there's two fires happening in California as we speak. There's one in mm. SoCal that is in the San Fernando Valley, Malibu area. And the one that's over here is located in Chico, which is, I think, close to the Sonoma area. Yep, that's right. And I actually didn't go into the office today. I actually worked from home because I woke up and I had this like pretty bad headache and the uh the uh, I realized it was from the smoke and I looked out the window and the sky was just like orange, like this really weird shade of orange. My house is pretty ventilated, so I didn't really think much until I went outside today and it was really bad. Um I kept sneezing a lot, kept coughing a lot. Yeah. This is the time when you need one of those like N99 masks. Yeah, those I brought one of those masks. Yeah, I brought one of them to China when I was in China in Oof. May. And I still have it now and it still works obviously. I still have the filters, but today would have been a nice day to put it on and walk around and go to go to work, but actually I was just like, you know what? I'm going to stay home. Nah. I turned on my I turned on my air purifier and I was like, you know what? This is much better. So, my room in my house is the only room that is actually <laughs> <laughs> really pure and it doesn't smell like a campfire my kitchen smells like a campfire my brother's room and my living room all smell like a campfire and it's just like oh boy oh this boy is, uh, i know this is really bad <laughs> i feel like i'm getting like memories from boy scouts and i'm like do it where are the marshmallows <laughs> you know it's really dangerous <laughs> i forgot the statistic when the napa fire happened last year but it was a statistic where breathing in this air for a certain amount of hours straight is the equivalent of smoking i think b four or just multiple packs of cigarettes yeah it depends on the air quality index and you can look that up on google it was pretty bad today it was like 165 which is pretty unhealthy like the, the the max is 200 i believe and that's like super unhealthy for everyone but and 165 it's windy. yeah see that's the bad part you would think that the wind would blow it away but it actually blows it to us and it's like no please yeah. stop um yeah no there's there's a certain point where it just gets really really bad and it's the equivalent of smoking like a pack of cigarettes i know that in mexico city if you like breathing there for like an hour and a half or something is the equivalent of smoking one cigarette mm. i forget the statistic but there was something like that I don't know how bad it is now, but um, yeah, no, right now, if you go outside, it still does kind of smell like smoke in San Francisco. Wasn't as bad so. as this morning, but I think it's causing a lot of weather changes. It's colder today, and it's because um, the smoke is trapped in these clouds, <laughs> Yeah, which is not a good thing at all. Yeah, I know. That's going to come back to us. Yeah. SOS need rain. Uh, SOS need help. <laughs> rain on me, please. Yeah, seriously. It's it's still like we have a little bit of Indian summer left, which is okay. Let's face it, y'all. It's going to be summer all year round now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with that, but that's very scary. <laughs> playing to transition into video games yeah um i just finished yakuza kiwami 2 like right now it, nope not right now okay. i finished it two days ago okay okay i was like <laughs> no 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 good, good, i'm not playing i don't want <laughs> I, I read a text of yours that said i'm doing a mission <laughs> oh yeah i was doing the uh the bodyguard missions oh, okay yeah so, I finished Yakuza Kiwami 2. It was a long, hard road. 
And it took me a long time, and I mentioned this when I started playing Yakuza Kiwami 2 back in August, is that I wanted to take my time with this game. This was definitely um, longer than Kiwami 1. That's Oh, for no, sure. for sure. Yeah. I spent a lot more time playing this game and doing all the extra activities. Um, there was a lot of things that I wanted to go back and do, and some things like the Cabaret Club, which I still love. And I, I finished the whole storyline for the Cabaret Club. Oh, I did too. Yeah, but I just use it as a bank now. Like, if I need to make money, I'm like, you know what? I have three minutes. I'm Easiest just gonna go. way to make money in the Yakuza oh series by far. Oh, yeah. You can roll so hard. And so playing that game so many times made it so much easier later on. Not, not to mention the fact that I was so buffed up because I mentioned this before that I was saving myself from finishing the game because I wanted to buff up Kiryu like at chapter five and beyond. And so I did. I buffed up Kiryu to the max. And... I got a lot of money, and so that those two things in itself will help you complete the rest of the game. Definitely, like, storyline storyline wise, like the other stuff, like the mini games, they don't. Those two things don't really matter. I mean, the money kind of does, but the the like the mini games are so cheap that it, that money doesn't really matter. Um, so towards the end of the game, every single boss, even the final twists and turns, were much easier for me. I felt like. I, I of course I didn't have any frame of reference since I was buffed up to the max and I had all, like all That's the best true. items on me. Uh I was okay and I played on normal mode. There were a lot of battles that were a little bit tough, but I was able to get it because I was buffed up on healing potions and I was decently okay. But I can imagine that if since you were maxed out, it was probably a lot easier. I wasn't completely maxed out by the time I finished. Oh, yeah. No, I, I totally get that. And it does help if you have like some items that break through the limit. So if you look on the stats page, you'll see, you know, everything is like S. But if you get like a special ring or a bracelet or some armor, then it'll like go past that and say like plus whatever number. And that really does help in the long run, because when you're fighting these bosses, like it, it gets crazy. So you want to be as you want to have as much health, as much of the heat gauge and as much as many weapons as possible how, to like beat all these bosses how did you how do you rank the final boss and in the in the previous yakuza game yakuza games that we've played yes oh man i think i still like zero's bosses more um but i'd say this is a close second i really enjoyed this boss battle for sure yeah i think it was i enjoyed it for the sheer fun of this is what I was waiting for the entire game, and it happened, mm. and it did not disappoint. Kiwami's boss was on the sad side for reasons, and yeah. Zero's bosses, Zero's bosses were introductory to the series and really set the tone in a badass uh, Yakuza Mafia way. And then Yakuza yeah. Six was more this boss was fine, but not reflective of. The entire series i suppose but i really enjoyed kiwami 2's boss a lot yeah and now that you put it into perspective that way i'm gonna have to say i liked both kiwami's and kiwami 2's bosses equally because of the emotional impact of the first one yes but also because of the whole yeah the whole storyline of yakuza kiwami 2 is very classic yakuza and the ending was very, very satisfying, and it closed a really big loop. I know. Although I still have a couple, I do have a couple questions, but they're not really related to the bosses. It's more of a everything is like said and done now. Like I, I feel satisfied by this ending. It's not like the ending of, of, of Kiwami, one or the ending of six, where I still have a couple questions where I'm like, but what happened to blank and blank? You know, I'll have to find out later or something like that. But I feel like the ending of Kiwami 2 was just so satisfying. It was. I agree. Very good. Um, There are some stuff, there are some things after the game that I want to talk about, but I will say that for our upcoming spoiler cast, which Elisa and I have yet to schedule, but of, of course, after every Yakuza game that we finish, we like to talk about it in depth, and we will have a spoiler cast regarding that. How do you rank the game now? Oh, man. Honestly, too soon, too soon. Honestly, okay. So of the four Yakuza games that I've played, I'm gonna say for me, storyline wise, or just everything about the game, just overall your overall enjoyment. So 
the entire package. Okay. I'm going to say zero, two, six, one. Mm-hmm. Uh, only because zero is the first one that ever got me hooked on the series, and it's very appropriately so, because it's supposed to be the starting point. And I loved everything about it, from the time period it was set in, to the clothing, to the, the stock car racing, to the characters, and I just felt like I was in Miracle Japan. Johnson. Exactly. No, everything about it, even Kiwami Bob. I was like, oh my God, I missed him so badly in Kiwami 2. And I'm like, dude, where's where's my clown boy? And I got him in Zero, and I was like, oh my God, this, this is my friend. You know, and then, and then, and then and I see him again in Kiwami 1. I'm like, yo, what's up, Bob? Kiwami 2, I'm like, where is he? He's 6, I'm like, where is he? Where's my friend Bob? One thing. He just leaves me. Yeah. No, one thing I was disappointed to not, to not see sorry am i even wording that correct what i was disappointed not seeing is pocket circuit racer guy i was expecting something for him to cut like to come out of the woodwork and do some random shit so i was expecting that too but at the end of kiwami one they kind of closed his story that to say that he was going to hiroshima and so i kind of didn't expect him to come back if he did it would be like (laughs) you know the fast and furious movies Yes. So the character Han from Tokyo Drift. Oh my like he, god. So Tokyo Drift is technically after Fast and Furious 6 but before Fast and Furious 7. And so also every movie, irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. So every movie after that came out after uh Tokyo Drift, which is Fast and Furious, Fast 5, Fast 6, the character Han appeared again. And it's kind of funny in Fast and Furious, which is technically the fourth movie. At the beginning of the movie, you see Han, and he's like, you know, doing his stealing shit with Dominic Toretto. Yeah. And and then they're all play- like, they're like chilling on the beach, and then Dominic Toretto's like, "It's time for you to do your own thing." And then Han's like, "I heard they're doing some crazy shit in Japan." I'm like, "All right, cool. We're never gonna see him again." Fast Five. Is that Han? Oh boy. He's like, "I'm best here for the job." Fast and Furious Six. Hey guys, you called me back. <laughs> at the beginning of seven hey guys i'm dead i'm like dude you guys are you guys keep milking this character <laughs> like that so if if they pulled that with pocket circuit fighter i don't think i feel like his comeback in six wouldn't have been as sweet that was a you know good comeback I mean? too i wasn't expecting it fucking tofu yeah. seller my god <laughs> i know well i mean didn't he say his family owned a tofu business in hiroshima and so that's why he was in onomichi yeah so I was like, wow, dude, that's he really they stayed true. The, like the the developers stayed and the writers stayed true to the canon. And I have to appreciate that because the canon of the game is something that is kind of bended over time. But what I mean by that is Yakuza, the 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 Kiryu we see in Yakuza Kiwami 1 is actually older than the Kiryu we see in the in the first Yakuza game ever. And he's like older by 10 years and I they're trying to change the canon by releasing these Kiwami games to kind of like fix things that we didn't really see like Date's daughter for example yes um stuff like that so I think it's really cool that they're not just retconning the series they're also adding on to it and making it more coherent definitely we as fans always crave more and the Yakuza games are all about detail. There's so many little things in the game that I didn't find out until I actually finished the game. And I'm referring to Kiwami 2, by the way. Mm. And I think that goes for every Yakuza game. There's there's always these little tiny things that you don't really think about until you actually do it. Like the actu- the ac- uh, like the acupuncture guy in uh, in Osaka. Did you ever find him? Yes. Yeah. I didn't know about him until like way later in the game. And I was like, what the hell? This guy could have... I could have learned so much from this guy. Yeah, you could have let, you. You could have um, learned some skills and some uh, new actions. Yeah, no, totally. But then I realized that I did the right thing because I actually did most of the Coliseum fights, and then I went to the acupuncture guy, and that's actually what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go, do a bunch of Coliseum fights, go to the acupuncture guy, and he'll unlock everything for you. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know that until later, but I guess it was a happy accident. Happy accidents only. Yeah. Anyways, I'm talking too much about the game. Again, I don't want this to be a Yakuza cast. That's a separate podcast. I just want to let you know, Elisa, that I finished the game. I loved it. I loved all the characters in it. Sayama Kaoru is bae, dude. Oh, my God. Dude, totally bae. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. (laughs) I'm like, yo. Um, Anyways, yes. I love Yakuza Kiwami 2. I cannot wait for 3, 4, 5. 
and whatever comes next in the in the Yakuza series. I'm probably going to get Judge Eyes, and we, we discussed this during the E3 press conference. I'm going to get Judge Eyes in the future when it comes out to the West. End of my Yakuza Kiwami 2 rant. Um, the other two games that I'm playing, one is Super Mario Party, and I'm playing this with just friends and whoever comes over. I'm like trying to introduce this Chilling, game to people. Chilling, hanging out. I, yeah, exactly. I love this Mario Party game, first of all. I think this is the one of the best Mario Party games since the original two. I love the original two on the N64 so much, but I think this is game, coming in between those two games. I feel like Super Mario Party is a solid addition to the Mario Party franchise. I love all the characters. I love the strategies you have to do. I love the custom dice blocks, the mini games. There's so many games that I'm like, eh, it's okay. But most of all, I think that this really does make your friends into enemies and maybe sometimes make your enemies into friends. <laughs> but I think that this game is really cool. I want to keep playing it with friends. I think I, I sometimes I, I play some of the mini games by myself. I think it's really fun. Just like there's this thing called Challenge Road where you have to unlock certain characters. There's actually four unlockable characters. Donkey Kong, Diddy Kong, Pom Pom, some like Ninja Girl and uh, dry bones and the way to unlock two of them is by playing challenge road and challenge road is basically the quote-unquote single player mode of super mario party where you follow this path play every single mini game in uh in super mario party and then once you beat certain sections you unlock special characters okay yeah it's it's kind of a single player aspect of, for them to like give out to people like saying like hey it's not just a multiplayer game but there's also some single player aspect to it um, I'm gonna be playing it with some friends this Sunday, so uh, can't stop talking about Super Mario Party. I love that game so much. Um, and there, like this has been a party game for years and twenty years for twenty years, and the fact that it's still going and it's still keeping people interested and bringing people together and ruining friendships—it's all <laughs> you can really ask for. Yep. There's a cheap thing you can do in the game where you can go do, like, Kitu. He's the guy that holds the camera in Super Mario 64, and he's in this game. He's, like, a staple Mario character. You can go to him on the board if you're playing the four-player party mode, and you can steal stars from someone, and that's the best way to get someone mad at you and also <laughs> to ruin your friendship with them is by stealing their star because stars are currency in the game, as everyone knows, so whoever has the most stars at the end wins the whole game. Yes. So I, I like to think of Mario Party, and I, I like kind of like to pitch it to people, is that it's a virtual board game. It's not just a video game. Yes, there's video game aspects to it, but that's like saying if the game of life was put on Steam and, you know, you played it that way. It's the same thing, you know. It's it's a board game, but you play it through your TV. Makes sense. Yeah. So get Super Mario Party. Black Friday's coming up. I recommend everyone to play it. I think it's a super fun game. It's a lot more fun when you're playing with friends who are next to you because you could mess with them. And uh, How's the online? I haven't played online. I actually don't have Nintendo Switch online. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't really see any value in it right now, simply because the only thing I would find value in is the um, the NES emulator. But I feel like I already own most of those games cartridge, like the actual cartridge for my actual NES. So there's really no point in me like playing it again. Um. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's it's fun so far, the, the game as a whole. And... uh. Another thing to play that is really popular with Mario Party is Shario Party or Birio Party. Birio Party? Birio. It's like Birio you drink beer. Party. Yeah, yeah. And Shario Party, you drink shots, but drink responsibly if you're playing those. And I'm trying to do that soon. I don't know. It's it's. I just want to play Mario Party and be intoxicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not an alcoholic, I promise. Yep. <laughs> and the last thing that I'm playing... After I finish Kiwami 2 is actually Super Mario Odyssey. I'm trying to finish it. I'm actually just going to speed run through it and, and finish it. Like The story's really good, but I really don't have time to play all the extra stuff. I just want to finish this game because I got it to play for the story. And I, and everyone's been saying the gameplay mechanics are really unique for uh, a big Mario title on the Switch. And I love it so far. I've mentioned this game before in previous podcasts. I think this game is pretty awesome. It's pretty unique. Um, right now I'm in new donk city, but I went to the beach level. So if you got any tips, let me know. That's all. Yeah. Alisa, what are you playing? 
So I am continuing to play Red Dead Redemption 2. I'm out of the mountains. I'm out of the cuts. And I like it. It's a great game. Really, mm. really enjoying it now. This is... So I guess the way that I'm enjoying the experience is it's just me, myself, and I with a blanket and headphones. And I'm just enjoying the scenery. I'm enjoying all of the music and the cuts of like harmonica in between. And I'm enjoying all the horse rides. I'm enjoying the weather so much more now because now that we're out of the snow, it feels much more dynamic. And the scene where I'm riding down the mountain for the first time and the snow is melting and you're seeing the green and shrubbery come alive as you're going to your first base camp was amazing. I like I love that scene, the entire thing. It was so beautiful. And that's when I realized this is a good game. This is this is awesome. I feel immersed now that that was the downhill road was the first time I felt immersed in the game. Wow. I mean, I know that Red Dead Redemption so far has been praised by fans, um, not just for its scenery, but also the music, the gameplay, uh, the characters, the story. Yes. But I do think I do think that the scenery stands out the most because I've saw I've seen screenshots and I've seen gameplay and it looks like these the mountain areas, like the forests, the hills, the trees, it all looks surreal. It all looks like a painting. I think that's really cool. It really is. And what's awesome now that I'm playing through it is the weather changes as well. So that, I'm really enjoying that. You can have thunder in this game. Whoa, that's I, cool. I, I've only seen it in the distance, um, which you're supposed to see it anyways, but it would be cool if I was actually close to the thunder. It would be for a cool video or a screenshot. But yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Um, I know. So the funny thing is now that I'm playing it more, I don't mind that it's a fucking long ass game, but (laughs) a lot of, um, not a lot of, well, a lot of people, it seems very split half and half. You have the group that thinks this is too long and you have the group that's like, this is a long game and it is what it is. And for me playing this game. So I've accepted I don't think I'm going to finish Red Dead 2 in 2018. There's too really? many things to do, honestly, in terms of side missions that I that I'm pretty obsessed with, like bounties. I think I got like t- eight seven, or I think I've gone like six bounties already. <laughs> and um I I'm just enjoying doing a lot of the random shit. It almost feels like Skyrim to me. This game really does feel like Skyrim. I and you know how Skyrim has a storyline and it has multiple missions and people that you can talk to, but it's like you're kind of okay if you don't ever do the storyline. Yeah. This so this is a Rockstar game, so the storyline is important, but the way it's presented to me, like I do like I I want to finish the storyline, but some of it's like, damn, there's too much though. <laughs> there's too much to do. Yeah. So I I give the direct comparison that this is Rockstar's Skyrim. There's I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people don't do the storyline. Oh, uh, yeah. And also, in a way of not doing the storyline, it might be protecting John's first storyline from Red Dead Redemption 1. Protecting it, and I don't say protecting it, like, John's not, John's definitely much more, one of the much more, like, uh, not weaker minded. He's one of the nicer people, for sure, in that gang. You're talking about John Marston? Yeah, John Marston. Oh, okay, from from the original from Red the Dead. original one. So in Red Dead Redemption Two, he's he's recovering from uh, an injury, and he's like he's fine, but um, he's kind of wimpy in this game. <laughs> so I and I think part of that too is that you have these leaders, and part of the reason that he became who he was in Red Dead Redemption One is going through all this bullshit. Interesting. So it's like, it's not like the strongest, but I think that's actually the point 
of the game right now at okay. least uh-huh yeah i really enjoy arthur morgan who's the main character of this uh insignificant fact but i shaved him i i'm keeping him clean cut i know a lot of people are trying to grow out his beard but i i'm just gonna i'm gonna just shave him all the time <laughs> shave him all the time yeah I think you. So I think you he, have to keep constantly shave him. No, you don't. Like you can have him be have a beard the entire time. No, no. What I mean is like his beard grows out over time in the game. Um. Yes. Whoa. I don't know how fast it grows. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, but you kind of have. There's a lot of cosmetic things that. Whether or not you care about that, that you can keep up with. So you can have like a full bushy beard guy if you wanted to. Yes. Yes, That's you can. That's cool. That's very cool. And okay. then I am um the one thing I haven't really done yet, cause cause I've been doing a lot of investment in my camp and my gang. I need to figure out my horse situation. Like, I don't know, like, I actually still have the default horse that you were given in the beginning. What's wrong with that? Um, I want a white horse, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I see how it is. <laughs> no. It's a racial thing. Oh it's a racial thing. <laughs> okay, all right, Elisa. <laughs> oh, wow. And I know it's 1899, Wow, but, you know. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. You went there. <laughs> oh, man. Nothing wrong with white horses, though. No, I think I think that would look beautiful. Yeah, I, I think it would look good for the scenery, especially. Mm. Especially in the sunlight. Oof. Yeah, take some good screenshots, post it on Instagram. I don't know. I know. Also, one thing that I really enjoy about the storyline is that the... It's including a lot of minority groups and Native Americans. I don't. Oh, cool. I don't recall if Red Dead Redemption even went into Native Americans and black people. I don't think they did. But um, this game for sure is like touching on those points. And I, I, I think it's really cool. It's not just Mexicans. It's like everyone's included at this point. Okay. And it's that's cool. Yeah. I'm really, really enjoying that aspect. Um, uh, yeah, I will say that I've heard a few things and I just wanted to reiterate it on the podcast. The PlayStation 4 version of Red Dead is perfectly fine so far. Like I have, I am doing okay playing it, but I have heard that the Xbox version runs better, but it, it doesn't surprise me either because I, I think Rockstar and Microsoft in general have better compatibility. So it's more, if you have both of the consoles in existence, it's better for you to get the Xbox version. Yeah. Is what I'm hearing. But uh, but for me, the PlayStation version is perfectly fine. And to be honest, I don't think a lot of people would care about that, but it is good a detail like, to, to think about because people do comparison all the time between PC, Xbox, PS4. Yeah. But a lot of people also don't realize that the general consumer doesn't really care and they just will pick the game and it, whatever whatever game they want and if it runs it runs if it doesn't okay well that's the developer's fault right yeah it's true but yeah I do, I do think it's interesting that the xbox one does run better than the ps4 one it, it doesn't surprise me because especially when grand theft auto 5 came out it it was more heavily favored for the xbox at the beginning there, yeah. there were there were just more perks in that regard. And I also do think Xbox Live has been around for so long, so obviously there's a lot more people Support. playing on it. Yeah. Yeah. True that. Um, one more comment I want to say about Red Dead Redemption 2 is I was hearing some things and there seems to be some glitches that happen in the game a game and sometimes there's glitches in missions i have heard around the block that if you are experiencing glitching in your mission and something had gone completely wrong in your loss 
it is better for you to restart the entire mission, even though it sucks ass, versus restarting checkpoint. I have, from things that I've been hearing, it's advised to not restart at checkpoint. Oh. I have not, See, I have not experienced what that means yet, but take that as you will. These are the kind of things that I'm like, I'm glad I didn't buy it on day one because I'll be experiencing that. But <laughs> at this, I'm letting everyone else, quote unquote, beta test it for now. Yeah. Uh, I do still want to buy this game, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait a little bit more. They're probably going to come out with an update in two weeks and it'll be in time for Black Friday. TBH. Good. Good. <gasps> Good. Good. I will do all my shopping on Amazon for Black Friday. That's that's how you do it. <laughs> I'm going to buy No Man's Sky on Black Friday for sure and uh, and um Stardew Valley. Those are the two games that I've for sure decided I'm going to get. I forgot No Man's Sky is good now, but Stardew Valley, what what system are you going to be buying it on? I'm guessing PS4. No, I'm going to just buy it on PC. PC needs love. Yo, yo, I have it on PC too. Yeah, I'm gonna get it on Steam. <laughs> okay, cool. Yes. I, I want I want to play it. Let's let's build a farm because they have co-op now. I know. That's actually the reason why I want it. Well, okay, I've always wanted to get Stardew Valley. But then finding out that there's co-op, oh man. Come through. Let's make some yo, carrots. If you're listening and you have Stardew Valley on PC, specifically Steam, hit us up. We'll all start a farm together. It's gonna be awesome. Come through. Yeah, I'll make a I'll make a, a chat specifically for Stardew Valley in yes. our Discord. So join our Discord. Go to our website, www.downtime.live. On the left side, you'll see community. Click on that and join our Discord where we talk about video games, everything non-video games, and everything in between. So click on that, join us, and we will play Stardew Valley together. I know. God God knows that I love methodical daily video game simulations so <laughs> this is right up my alley i'm so hyped for when this happens and same this is for me stardew valley is kind of like animal crossing and harvest moon had a baby but they didn't know who the parents are <laughs> for some reason oh man but more closer more closer to harvest moon <laughs> <laughs> And then the last game that I'm playing is uh, Valkyria Chronicles 4. I actually started Valkyria Chronicles 4 a while ago. I think I was so... Um, um, Red Dead 2 just came out. It slipped my mind that I forgot to talk about Valkyria Chronicles. But this game is awesome. I love this game so much. It is way better than the first one, which I played and I I love. But... It takes everything, every mechanic of Valkyrie Chronicles 1 and just, like, adds some pizzazz to it, pretty much. There's, nice. it's And also, it's just a wonderful comic book manga-style video game, and it's great. I love it. Um, I am three chapters away from beating the game, I think, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... Honestly, didn't expect to even finish it this early, but I got so into it and so into the um, missions that I ended up just spending so many hours, and I'm I'm really close to beating it now. And nice, yeah, I really enjoy the battle system, the strat, uh, the tactical battle system, as well as the leveling up system, like you go to a headquarters and you have a team, your squad. So your squadron has, I want to say almost like 30 people on it. And you, um, so in the squad, all these people have five positions or they, they take place in either one of five positions. And so you're leveling up these five positions in the headquarters and you're training okay. them and you're also building up your tank you're also improving your weapons, and it's all good. It's great. Um, one nice. aspect that I really enjoy is um, squad stories in this game. So squad stories in this game, I told you that the squad has like 30 people, maybe even almost 40 people. Um, so they 
have a like a detailed info tab where they tell you each person on the squad and who they prefer working with. So for example, take um this character um Raz. And this character Raz works really well with another character um Claude. So it's better for so when you do missions it's good to put those two together versus you put Raz in but no Claude in that mission. And oh. when you do when you satisfy these pairings they will unlock squad stories and the squad stories will improve those characters because those characters it's very similar to the cabaret in Kiwami 2 where each cabaret member has potentials but sometimes those potentials are bad but if you improve and you train the mainstays then their potentials will get better it's the same thing with Valkyria Chronicles 4 so each member of the squad may have a potential and the potential's very like it sucks like for example like it won't allow you to move it ha- like you like all your APs drained if it's like it's it can get really shitty so by doing these squad stories it accomplishes two things it's like one like you're learning about every single goddamn person on the squad which is cool because their stories are actually fun and two Mm -hmm. you're upgrading their bad negative potentials into positive ones Mm, that's cool yeah so that is a lot of fun um so recently i unlocked a um a squad story for these two characters uh nico and rosetta i think are their names and yeah uh like i'm just going through all of that i'm doing a lot of the optional storylines it's fun um i will say like valkyria chronicles kind of goes hard in the storyline um i wasn't expecting the storyline to pick up until maybe like halfway through the game but almost immediately in like chapter two or in chapter three it's like you get your squad together and there's this character named riley and riley um has to work with the main care who the main main character claude and riley's like claude the coward or like cowardly claude and and everyone's like Ooh. Damn. <laughs> damn and then oh my god i could like this blew my like this blew my mind so claude was having um confessions with um this girl named minerva and like like minerva drops a bomb on him in like chapter four and i was like what i didn't i was not expecting that at all so like Mm. they go pretty hard already in the beginning of the game and my favorite character kai who's like the total bay of this game um she there's something about her character that you find out in chapter five um and like okay you would have it it's just one of those things like oh wow they went into it already like it's like i can imagine a storyline where a lot of these plot points aren't even addressed until like the later half of the game so the fact that they just do it at the beginning there's even more drama towards the end of the game oh spicy super spicy it's an awesome game for 2018 10 out of 10 for sure i'm probably gonna finish it this week as someone who is looking to get into the series four is probably not a good place to start or would you say otherwise i think valkyria chronicles one is the best place to start because it will introduce the style of this game but not be super bloated like valkyria chronicles four like valkyria chronicles four is like an exponential improvement of valkyria chronicles one okay so it's better to do that one first just so that you understand the style also um these games are pretty short i think they're only like 20 25 hours it's not bad okay but actually i that it that all depends on how fast you can grasp what the mission is if you can figure if you kind of figure out how to do the mission and you can do it in five rounds these are like easy peasy 
But sometimes I'll have like the missions where I, I'm just like, what? How, how the hell do you do that? And it takes yeah. like 15 out of my 20 turns to like figure it out. So that's why it balances out. Like sometimes I have really good days where I recognize how to finish this damn thing in like three turns. And other days I'm like taking up 14 turns. So <laughs> just it all depends. And oh, and also it's easy to plan. So um, Kevin um, from the Discord is also playing this game. And it's actually pretty, actually quite a few people are playing on the Discord. I just haven't caught up with that conversation because I wasn't into it at at the time. I didn't have the game yet. But um, it's pretty easy to platinum this game because since it's presented in a comic book style, or not a comic book, but a scrapbook style, you can just replay things very easily. So... Okay, that sounds accessible. Yeah, it's super accessible. Anyways, that's all I have to say. Um, it's a wonderful game. And it's also made by Sega. And you know what else Sega makes? Yakuza. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> it all came full circle. <laughs> yes. But yeah, Sega's killing it with the localizations. Valkyrie Chronicle 4, like, I think 2 and 3 were not even released in the United States at all. I'm maybe yeah I'm I did I think I'm right so (laughs) I think I'm right so I think only one in four were localized to English yeah I mean I think there's a demand for this kind of thing and Sega is definitely delivering and they are capitalizing on this demand for sure it's great what Sega's what Sega is doing right is they're taking all of their Japanese games that they assume that no one wants to play and localizing mm-hmm. it and realizing, oh, people want to play Japanese games. I'm like, no shit. So yeah. <laughs> give it to us. Yeah. <laughs> and I just want to say, shout out to Sega. You guys are doing awesome stuff. I've always loved Sega. I love Sonic. So <laughs> sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that's uh, yeah, Valkyria Chronicles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, this air. <laughs> <laughs> this air is giving me uh, sponsorship. Uh, I just keep saying random words. I don't know why. <laughs> oh man. So, anything else that you're playing? Nope. That's it. Let's get into news. So there's something big that happened a couple days ago that we need to talk about because holy crap. There's quite a few things, but I think we, I think I know which one you're talking about because it was like, it blew up so badly. (laughs) Oh, so Square Enix. Yeah. Square Enix. What, how could you, how could you do this to me? Only like two, three days ago too. So the short story, which is actually a pretty short story. (laughs) <laughs> um, so, uh, so Nomura Tetsuya, which is the um, showrunner uh, for Final Fantasy 15 and has been around since 2012 or 13, I don't remember which one, he left Square Enix and he was the person who was handling all the DLC for Final Fantasy 15. And when he left, all the DLC got canceled. All the future DLC for Final Fantasy XV got canceled. And the point of the DLC was it was supposed to explain a lot of the in-between stuff of the game. Uh, quick correction. Actually, Tetsuya Nomura still works for Square Enix. He's just directing uh, uh, Kingdom Hearts 3. The guy that you were talking about is Hajime Tabata, and he started directing Final Fantasy XV in 2014 when... Um, uh, uh, Tatsuya Nomura left the project in 2014 oh, to focus his work on Kingdom Hearts 3. But no, yeah, you're you're in the right spot. The content after that is is perfectly fine. But so it's the guy Hajime Tabata was actually gonna start um working on a new studio within Square Enix called Luminous Studios, and he had all these plans set up for future projects. I guess within the Final Fantasy universe and also outside of it. But then they just during like a live stream, they just like canceled all the deal. They announced all the DLC, and then he like canceled all of it in the same live stream. Yeah, that it's was like, so dude. weird. I was watching it. That was odd. Yeah, I mean, they had like three, four episodes planned after the fact, and the fact that all of them are gone now is just insane. Like, I know it's not even going to be worked on by other people. It's just that's it. 
<laughs> see, part of me, I was going to buy this game this year, actually. This is on my Black Friday list, but now I kind of don't want to buy it. <laughs> yeah. I'm... But you own it, right? Oh, I own it. You can borrow it. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a perfect. It's a perfectly fine Final Fantasy. I'm I'm surprised by how this all just kind of blew up. Yeah. So because was, there was I'm... going to so there was going to be an episode for every like all the main characters. So. Yeah. If if you're a fan of this game, I'm sorry. Like I feel for you. That's that's one of the reasons why I don't want to buy it is because even though I'm not a fan of the the series as a whole, I just if that was me, I would feel left out. You know, like I feel like this game is incomplete now. Even as even not as a fan, I I just feel like they're delivering something that was that's not the full potential of what it's supposed to be. Yeah. That sucks. That's like giving out a Mario game and Mario is missing an arm and saying, oh, sorry, we forgot to program the arm. I know. She's got one arm. Like, what the hell? I almost wonder what this means for the future of Final Fantasy and even Square Enix. I think Square Enix is fine as long as they're publishing. Like, they have quite a few third-party studios that they can publish for, but in terms of developing... Um, Final Fantasy w- is a pretty big deal and, uh, you know, also Kingdom Hearts, but if they're kind of doing this and I, I just kind of don't know what the future of that specific franchise is, which is crazy because they haven't even finished the Final Fantasy seven one that everyone has been waiting for as well. I, there's just a lot of questions. Honestly, I think they're going to keep making Final Fantasy games as a whole. I mean, it's it's like their most billable franchise next to Kingdom Hearts of course, but yeah, I mean like they Square Enix is known for Final Fantasy. I I would like to argue that this is their flagship series. So for them to stop working on it is kind of like saying like Nintendo's going to stop making Mario games. So I still think they're going to finish Final Fantasy 7. Actually, you know what? I don't know if they're going to finish Final Fantasy 7 remake. I mean, they will finish it when they will finish it. Oh. In like 15 years? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll come out on the PS5. So maybe like in 2022 or whatever. Yeah. Damn, Final Fantasy 15 is also another example of a very beautiful game. That's a good one, too. Yeah, visually. I, the only reason I wanted to pick it up is because visually it looks amazing. The gameplay is cool. The story is really unique. But, um, yeah, I mean, if it goes on sale for a really good price, I think it's like 25 something That's right actually now. A, a pretty decent price. If it goes down to 20 I say it's worth getting on Black... F- I think 20 would be good for what, for how it's aged. Yeah. And I'm 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 adamant about getting it, like, in general, not not soon, but in general. Yeah. We'll see how much it costs on Black Friday. For sure. Um, speaking of Black Friday, really quick, I. So, th- just really quick about like, the whole thing of, on um Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. There's a Nintendo Direct that came out. And they talked about like new characters, levels, game modes, et cetera, et cetera. And it was like 40 something minutes long, I think. Um, and I actually pre ordered the game back in October. And I got an email on Tuesday saying that my game was ready to download. And I was like, hey. sweet. And then I got an email an hour later saying that my order was canceled. <laughs> Ooh. And I was like, what the hell? I reached out to Amazon. I was like, yo, what the fuck? And then they were like, hey, um, looks like there's a developer issue and they had to cancel your order. A I was developer like, right. issue. And so the whole day I was debating, well, should I just buy the game again and see what happens? Because my credit card got refunded. So I was like, all right. So I bought the game again and I got the code. I was like, all right. What hey. the hell? <laughs> so now I have Final, not Final Fantasy. Um, now I have Super Smash Bros. Ultimate preloaded onto my Switch. And on the same day, I actually bought the Smash Ultimate GameCube controller, even though I do have GameCube controllers. Yeah. It's always nice to have a new, fresh one. And I also have the adapter for GameCube controllers to the Switch. So I'm ready and I'm ready to play Super Smash Bros. Ultimate when it comes out on December 7th. Awesome. Yeah. Ready to go. Ready. Let's do it. You know? I know. You're not letting Amazon mess with you now. Uh, Yeah. That's cool, though. You got it early. Yeah. 
I did. In a way, I got it super early. Yeah. So that's good. So it's sitting, it's sitting on my Switch dashboard, but I can't do anything. Like, it's yeah, there, until, ready to be played. Until it comes out. Yep, and like you can click on it. It says the we're gonna check if the software is ready to play through the internet. I'm like, all right, and then it'll like load, and it'll say, sorry, the software is not ready. I'm like, okay, all but I'm sure someone's someone's gonna hack into it. I bet <laughs> someone will. All that matters is that you have it loaded and ready to go when the time comes. Yep, yep, yep. So it was just it was a weird series of events that happened on Tuesday where I was like, oh. Your your DLC is canceled, or not DLC. Your game is canceled. I was like, "What the hell? I didn't know you can cancel it that fast." <laughs> but hey, I mean, I was reading uh, that some other users had the same error, and they just had to rebuy the game. And I was like, "All right, whatever." Yeah, for sure. Um. Anyways, you had more news that you wanted to to discuss. Yeah. So something's weirds going on re- with Rainbow Six Siege and Ubisoft. So. Um, the latest iteration of Rainbow Six is coming out and, you know, it's going to be released internationally. Uh, typically in the Rainbow Six franchise, it's pretty violent. There's a lot of things going on and they want to localize this to China. And what Ubisoft decided to do was in, and China has quite a few laws, because China is uh govern China's government uh, censors a lot of things instead of just creating a version of Rainbow Six Siege just for China to satisfy those bylaws they are changing the entire game even the western game to just satisfy the, the China release wait so they're changing it internationally the whole like Ubisoft's announcement was that it would be a hassle to create two versions of the game in parallel so the version that china gets is the version that everyone will get really which is we- interesting they're going to censor a lot of things <laughs> okay i think they're censoring blood they're censoring gambling and they're censoring sex as well okay which are things that have always kind of been there <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I I actually got the game when I bought my graphics card for my computer and I actually stopped playing it because it was through Ubisoft's Uplay and I hate Ubisoft Uplay. Yeah. But um I started playing it and it's pretty violent. Like you there's a lot of blood when you're shooting people and like yeah, no, there's there's a lot of things going on like you said. So the fact that they're going to censor most of this stuff is kind of like why would you censor hallmarks of the franchise? It's weird to me that they're going to censor like they don't want to just create another version. I mean, I suppose it's it's hard doing that, but it's a pretty significant change to something that's always been in the franchise. At this point, I would just not even sell it to China. If you can, if you have to censor all those stuff, why are you even playing it <laughs> in China? <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, China has so many video games, like online games that are free. Yeah. And it, the same with, like, I guess most of Asia, like Philippines, Korea, Japan, they have a lot of video games that we don't play and we don't really see or know about it most of the time because it's something that's only localized for their region and they don't want to localize it for outside regions. Yeah. So, and, and to, put, to put it also into perspective, a lot of developers have, d- like, censor not well not really censored but have modified their game assets for different regions for whatever reason like left for dead had to change the the box art of their of their game but i know that's something minor but the fact that ubisoft is changing an entire game for a worldwide release is kind of too late i think like why didn't they just do this in the beginning why did they have to do it now it's it's just, it's just ridiculous to me. I think the simple reason is I don't even know if they were planning on selling China in the first place. And now that they decided to sell to China, this just has to happen. I see. Yeah. Okay. That that's my interpretation. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't really play the game, but me I do neither. know a lot about I do know a lot about the series and the franchise itself. So, I mean, as a fan, as it's well as kind of, they're taking about. out the things that are intrinsically Rainbow Six. Yeah, I mean, at least they didn't get all their DLC canceled. <laughs> hey, sorry, fans of Final Fantasy. <laughs> it's like Rainbow Six is too violent. Take out all the violence. 
Mm-hmm. Take out the guns. Take out the bullets. Take out the blood. Take out the sex. <laughs> what do you have? A game where people are just running around. <laughs> and they break through windows and just stare at each other. Oh, I know, right? Um, uh, whatever, yeah. Uh, yeah, any more news that you wanted to talk about? The news. The, th- the news. Yep. The biggest news of last week. Ah, yes. Take it away, Jeremy. No, you, you go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I I may need a fact check. Okay. This was... Okay, Square Enix blew up, but this... Oh, Lord. This is... Okay, this is basically Battlefront 2.0. I am convinced now that every year there is going to be a gaming PR disaster that is the same level of Battlefront last year. Mm-hmm. So... BlizzCon just happened a week and a half ago, and during the keynote, they were just announcing a lot of things, and note that during this keynote, a lot of, um, BlizzCon has purposefully invited a lot of people who play Diablo, like, they got a lot of the top Diablo YouTubers to come here, specifically to this announcement, and they were expecting a like 15 second teaser of Diablo 4 or something. You know, they were expecting something. Maybe a DLC of 3, whatever. Um what ends up happening is the developer on the stage announces Diablo Immortal, which is a mobile game. And one of the main YouTubers for Diablo, he uh during the Q&A, he asks the developer is this going to come out to PC? Because that's what Diablo fans have been wanting for forever, I think. Is a, an update to the PC game or just a completely new game. And then developers said that it was only going to be on mobile. And, and that's when people started booing. Yes. And then the developers were like, what? You guys don't have phones? And then everyone's like, what the hell, dude? That's such a like diss to the fans. I know. And... He became the meme for the next six months. Yep. It's going to be there. And that quote itself is also a meme. Like, what? You guys don't have phones? You guys don't have phones? (laughs) So there's a lot of things to take away from this. First of all, Blizzard's a pretty big and popular company. I'd say all of the products that they've released have a huge following. Everything from Hearthstone to Overwatch, uh, Overwatch, yeah, to World of Warcraft, the the war, the, all the Warcraft games, StarCraft, even and everything has a huge following. Yes, and then uh, just one thing before you continue, all yeah. of these games or like the platform of Blizzard started off on PC. Yes, that. Take note from that, too. Yes. That Blizzard has always been a PC-centric company. They've always made games for PC. PC has always been first on their list. Kind of like Valve. Valve has always been like a PC-first kind of company. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people would compare Blizzard and Valve as the kind of companies that mirror each other, at least when Valve was still making software. Cough, cough. <laughs> um, but taking away from this announcement, it seems like fan outcry is a lot larger than what a company can produce. Like... A company is is so much in the limelight that if they take one small step in the wrong direction, people will lash out and people will give negative reaction, negative feedback. And the internet is a scary place. It is a very internet, scary place. The internet can dictate the direction of a company. They can <laughs> they can play Pokemon on Twitch, you know? It's it's insane. Like there's so many people with so many opinions that will type on their keyboard really hard and really fast about what they think this company should be doing that they don't realize that this is also just a company that's trying to make what they think is also best for their interests. At the end of the day, they need to make money. If they think that a mobile game on uh, in the Diablo franchise is going to make them a lot of money, then they'll go in that direction. So I could see this as a two-sided coin. I could be devil's advocate for both sides. You know, like for Square Enix... Not Square Enix. <laughs> Why am I saying Square Enix? For Blizzard, <laughs> they, they really want to make this a good game. They really want fans to like it, but they also don't realize that the fans have been crying out for a Diablo game for so long on PC that why would they want to play it on mobile? Like 
I understand that mobile gaming is a huge thing. And a lot of companies are trying to capitalize on that. They're trying to make their game available on mobile. Hell, even Blizzard created Hearthstone for mobile PC and other platforms. But, you know, the fact that it was on other platforms is what drew players. Not the fact that it was singly on mobile or singly on PC. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is Blizzard has to realize that they need to bring Immortal to both PC and mobile, if not all, all consoles, because that's the only way to reprimand this and make this better. I just, as, as a fan of video games, I don't, I wouldn't be appreciative if I found out that one of my favorite franchises had a mobile game and, th- and this was like supposed to be a sequel to a bigger franchise that I l- loved and adored. Like, let's say the next Yakuza game was only on mobile. I would probably would not play it. I'm not a huge mobile gamer myself. I, I don't really want to spend different. time playing. Yeah, exactly. I, I have expressed this on the podcast before. I just feel like, to me, I grew up old school, and playing a game with a controller or a keyboard and mouse is the way that I feel like a game should be played. I'm not trying to say that mobile gaming is wrong or incorrect or not the way that games are supposed to be played or that if you play a mobile game, you're not a gamer. I'm just trying to say that everyone has their own flavor. And my flavor just happens to be holding a physical controller or holding a physical device instead of tapping my thumbs on the screen over and over again. So the one way that I think this could have been um, alleviated, and I remember seeing the latest update, and it was the damage control, where one of the developers said, actually, we were going to announce Diablo 4 at this latest BlizzCon, we just it just wasn't ready to be announced yet and the context of 2018 is especially during the E3 um season there was we were getting teased that something diablo related was going to come out soon and everyone assumed it was a new game and you know long behold it is a new game it just so happens it's a mobile game i think that what would have made like the simple solution for this is um not making the diablo immortal announcement like a huge announcement of the diablo franchise i don't know if that like if you know what i mean like it like obviously announced diablo immortal but i wouldn't have made a spectacle invite all these high profile like diablo youtubers who are demand? Who have always wanted a PC game, and then just kind of drop the P- the mobile version on them. <laughs> yeah, like that's you're, they're basically just like shitting on them. Like, and... yeah, you know how sometimes they randomly just announce the new games in a conference out of nowhere, like not in the yeah. keynote. Like they'll just do it randomly at like one o'clock in the daytime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They should have yeah, done yeah. that, and I think they would have been totally fine. <laughs> And yeah, no, to add on to that, I, I think that it was a little too late for them to be like saying that, oh, this is, we were actually going to do this, but it wasn't ready. I feel like that's, that's not right. Like, that's not a way to alleviate a situation. I feel like during the conference after Immortal, they should have shown like at least the poster or at least the words Diablo 4 to like help make the situation better in a way, even if it wasn't ready. Like, that's what Nintendo did for Animal Crossing and also Metroid Prime. They just showed the title. Technically. And that was enough. Yeah. I agree. Technically, it's what Bethesda did with Skyrim. The Skyrim, um, the the six, sorry, not Skyrim, the six Elder Scrolls was just a 30 second trailer in the forest. And then it yeah. just had the time. Yeah. I think like even that would have been perfectly fine. Yeah. And even for the new Wolfenstein game, they didn't show any gameplay. They just showed like a cinematic trailer. And honestly, that's the way that I think announcement should be for a game. If, they, if they're if they not ready to show gameplay, then don't show the gameplay. Just show the title and to give people hope that it's coming out. Yeah. Because, you know, of course you're going to have rare situations where Final Fantasy or Kingdom Hearts, you know, that's just within one company. And not every game developer is going to have their game come out 10 years later. But if you're a game company that's known for releasing things on time or just releasing things in a in a in a fashion that fans can tolerate and wait for for you know in a, in a respectable amount of time then they should just release the title 
Yeah. You know, that that's all like that's all anyone can ask for. Just to know just so as fans we know and can confirm that it's coming out. Yeah. Definitely. And I like I think the response was very funny. Be- I'm not mm. a Diablo fan, so mm-hmm. uh, so like it. A lot of the parts were comical. A lot of the parts I understood. Like, damn, that does suck because what? Like, you know, that's like almost like what if Red Dead Redemption Two that was teased for all these eight years was actually a mobile game? You know what I mean? Like, I I get it, and. I also get that the resp- the response was too was c- kind of crazy. Like we don't need death threats, guys. This is not the world's not going to end. I think. Yeah. I think what needs to be looked at is, and which I don't have the knowledge for, is how has Blizzard been managing their fan base since their existence, and. There's got to and I there's got to be a reason why this was terrible. And what I what I like to um guess is that I think B- the Blizzard as a company the way it um treats its fans it may have a loot like that's just something happened and that's why the backlash was this bad. Maybe the fans have a lot of power, maybe like blizzard has been leading them on for some time but i don't have that knowledge of how blizzard treats people to really back that up but i feel like something in their business model caused this backlash to be this bad yeah okay yeah i agree yeah and yeah that's about it cool thank you for sharing that i totally forgot that that was the huge thing from last week. That's why I said you should go first. And I was like, what happened last week? Because last week felt like it was last month. I don't know why. Dude, there's so many articles on this shit. <laughs> I know. It's, yeah. I, I love that it's a meme now. It just, it helps people, especially the fans, alleviate the situation in their minds because they're like, oh, this is something I can make fun of and just have a happy time about. Yeah. And not not worry about it. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of Diablo fans will not play it, but I'm sure there are a few curious ones. Yeah, definitely. And who knows? It might actually be a good game. I just think that Blizzard, how it's been... However it's been running did not work today. And that's just something they have to assess in their business model of how they do PR. And first of all, I will just say... Don't have a developer on stage tell you, you guys don't have phones. That's probably the first step. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hand, if you're going to present something, make sure you handle the situation in front of millions of watchers, you know, through Twitch or YouTube Live or whatever. Professionally. Make sure that that per- yeah. Make sure that person knows what they're talking about. They sk- stick to the script, you know? Yeah. Don't don't try to, like, whip out these quick corpse. Like, they're not going to. They're not going to work. You're going to become a meme. Do you want to become a meme? That's how you become a meme. Yes, exactly. So, like one just, of like yeah. I can guarantee you, Jeremy, if that guy did not say that line, the backlash may still be there, but it wouldn't have reached this crazy level. Yeah. No, totally. Like they we would have less jokes, but everyone loves jokes. That is it for the news. We have one question by Divine Eater Oren, who just got back from vacation. So welcome back. Ooh, welcome back. Hope you like San Francisco. Yes. Seems like he was having the time of his fucking life. So <laughs> <laughs> I know, oh my right? God. He <laughs> apparently like he went to Mexico during Day of the Dead and he yeah, like what the fuck? <laughs> so And he and he bought Red Dead at the airport in LA. God. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Anyways. Li- oh, dude, you're awesome. <laughs> living his best life, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So cool. So cool. <laughs> so our question for this week is, you must choose one. Do you prefer realistic video games or fantastical video games? And I want to make a quick side comment from Hooded Dude below that said, that's a good question. Damn. And I also <laughs> want to say, I also want to say, Hooded Dude, you always ask good questions. So don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> always. Divine Eater, 
Yeah, and uh, Divine Eater Aron, thank you for submitting your question on our Discord. I mentioned earlier you can join our Discord. Um, it's a hard question. Going... Yeah. So. Um... I wait. I hold on. I'm sorry. We got to clarify some things. So I in in my head I can imagine what fantastical means, but I do have a like I would do want to clarify like, what if it's a realistic game but it's set in the future, and also, do you consider, like, for example, a zombie game a realistic game and a realistic video game? Because technically, if someone did have a disease, they could turn into a zombie. Like, you know, this could be the future in, like, 60 years. So I guess my question is, do the what-ifs count as realistic video games? Or do they all fall in line with fantastical video games? You know... I'm going to put it into perspective and make things simpler because I think if we keep adding these parameters, we're not going to answer the question properly. But I think, and I think a Divine Eater are on, I hope this is correct. Realistic video games, meaning like things that, not just like simulators, but I guess games that have like hunger bars and health meters, um, things that require you to constantly check your, you know, check yourself and make sure that you're okay as a player. And everything else will just fall under fantastical. Anything from like Animal Crossing to like Lego games. Okay. I think that's what he means. Unless he means like realistic video games like you play as the people and like Grand Theft Auto ish. But that could also fall under fantastical. But you know what? Now I'm falling into my own trap. So <laughs> let's put it, let's just do it this way. Which one do you prefer, Lisa? Fan- realistic video games or fantastical video games? Just based on the two words that he's asking. Realistic or fantastic? Oh, there's too much pressure. <laughs> I know. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer first. I'm going to say fantastic video games because I don't want to think about my real life when I'm playing a video game. I want to think about what the character is going through or if it's a first person game and the, the character doesn't talk, what I'm going through in a video game. I want to enter that world. For example, a Bethesda game. What if I'm playing Fallout 76? I want to be in West Virginia. I want to be walking around. I want to be that person. I don't want to think about going to my office job, sitting down and doing like work. I just feel like that's too much. I, I've expressed this before previously on the podcast. I feel like video games are a really good way of escapism, and that if you're playing Mario Party, you're not gonna think about your job or your school or your or the stress or your parents you're just going to think about winning that match if that makes sense if you're playing call of duty you're just thinking about killing fools left and right you're not thinking about other things that are not within that space unless that's your job to play call of duty so my answer i digress is fantastic oh my fantastical god video okay. games anyways Ooh. Man. Don't think about it too much. Okay. So this is where I um I'm thinking about it too much. Oh my god, don't think about it too much. Just, okay. No, no, just pick one. Left or right. Which one do you pick? You see, this is but there are legit games that walk the fine line of both. <laughs> exactly. Like David Cage games. And um, like I think of Persona 5, where Persona 5 is a very fantastical video game where you're looking inside a mystical world and portrayal of what your persona is, however it's interpreted in each game. But when you're and that usually happens during the evening of the game, but during the daytime of the game, you're a student and you're talking to people you're creating relationships you're going to class and answering questions and you're drinking coffee like you're going to the spa it's oh my god yeah there's realistic aspects to it but i think overall persona is a more fantastical video game really huh yeah i mean that goes for every video game there's there has to be some basis for players as human beings to relate to the game there's got to be like Something for us to feel emotionally. For example, the the Yakuza games, I think they're a fine line between realism and fantasy. 
like Kiryu is like this six foot tall muscular badass that can fight guys left and right and he's like almost unstoppable he's been shot how many times now in the series and yet he's still walking and he's okay and he recovers quickly like there's fantastic aspects to it but there's also realistic stuff like going to the vending machines going to a restaurant eating food meeting people talking to people like there's there's got to be some like frame of reference for us as players to connect to the game so I th- I think at a nitty gritty level, every video game has both a realistic and fantastical element to it. But yeah. if we're talking about this question specifically, I, one has to outweigh the other. Yeah, like for Yakuza, definitely the realism outweighs the fantasy. No, totally, totally. So, um, I think if I think if okay, so if I assess all the games that I play and I like, I think that. I like realistic games more. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And I think why I resonate with realistic games a lot more is a very simple reason, and it's that there's people. And don't get me wrong, I, I like I love my Final Fantasies like in 10 and 9 when you're not just having human characters but you're having mages and you're having animal characters and it's just a variety of different things and i always i love being put in a completely new world that is not linear to what is the current state of earth and i really enjoy that aspect like for example like a god of war that takes you into a world of the mythical um like gods and goddesses um i think at the end of the day though i like being grounded by a human and having it relate to something a frame of reference in history for myself or a frame of pop a frame of reference of pop culture and that will allow me to enjoy the game a lot more. Um, I think a really good example of this is the Yakuza game because it is based in a city that I know and I can recognize the time period in each part, as well as you can say the same for Red Dead. And um, the perfect example that I want to go with which is one of my favorite games of all time, is Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. And that frame of reference of 90s hip-hop and gangster culture um, real, like, is, really gets to me. So I think overall I enjoy realistic games more than... I think you... Yeah than fantastical games i think you and i answer this question differently because i was thinking more realistic games like simulators or like games where you have to like for example far cry 2 where you're like you have malaria and you have to constantly get medicine and it's a pain in the ass so games that have monotonous tasks that Mm. kind of pull you out and by fantastical i meant like games that have not really high fantasy fantastical but more of like elements that are not part of our current world but i mean it's fine the the way that we both interpreted it is different but i think we both answered it in a very similar way yeah def uh, my interpretation is much more of a like a fantasy like monsters and like alternate dimensions versus versus a detective story or versus right like la noir so that's that's yeah. that's how I interpreted this question. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um that was hard. <laughs> yeah, uh that was hard, but that was a really good question. Thanks Divine Eater Alron. Yeah. Oh man, my head hurts. I know. We should Let's go now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. That was Again. so much thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I know my my brain hurts. I don't. Maybe it's the smoke. Maybe it's this question. Okay. I don't know. Maybe it's both. Maybe it's the whiskey. I don't. I have no Who idea. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> uh, 
Um, everyone, thank you for listening. Me- remember to go to our website, www.downtime.live. Join our Discord on the left-hand side. Leave us a comment or question. Um, you can always you can always reach out to us the old-fashioned way, going to contact at downtime.live. Send us a comment, question. We'll read it on the podcast. Remember to leave us a review on iTunes, Apple Music. We will read it on the podcast as well. Um, you can listen to our podcast on Podbean, uh, YouTube, Apple Music, Google Music. Yeah, everything music. except for Spotify. Yep. Uh, find us everywhere. We are Downtime Podcast for games, and we will stay that way, talking about games and stuff. I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyways, everyone, thank you for listening to the (laughs) 78th episode of Downtime Podcast. Have a good night. Yes. Good night.